nice fruits. <coughs> from the previous section, um, from the previous section, uh, we haven't discussed um, about um, specific community rules that some of the ISPs have applied. So we'll discuss that before continuing with this one. But first, I want to review the um, agenda for this section. <coughs> So first we'll discuss, uh, after discussing the communities, we'll discuss the role of IGPs and IBGP. Uh, aggregation, which is very important for you know, the health of the internet, and we'll discuss that in more detail. Receiving prefixes from peers, customers, and transit providers. Uh, origin validation, or RKKI, um, for security, uh, verifying that the prefix received is originated from the, um, from, from the originator, from an authenticated origi origina uh, originator. Uh, and then we'll discuss about preparing the network and some configuration tips. <coughs> so before that, we'll, I'll review some of the um, uh, customer, sorry, uh, ISP community um, rules, what types of rules they use. Here's an example for Sprint. Um, so in this case, Sprint uses um, different AS numbers, the first using the 6500 range to influence to, uh, so that the, the customers can tell Sprint how many AS's Sprint can prepend to the AS pods. So if a customer wants Sprint to prepend, uh, for example, four AS cents, then they will use 65004 to a specific ASN. So traffic or routes advertised to a specific ASN, if it is prepended with 65004, then it will be advertised with four ASNs prepended. Um, and then for different regions, it has different values. <clears throat> so here's another example from NTT. In this case, um, Entity uses different communities for customers to influence what type of local preference to set. So if entity receives a specific community, in this case, for example, uh, the first one, 9914 colon 450, it will set uh, a local preference of 96. If, uh, if it is 460, it will set a local preference of 98 and so on. So customers can tell their service providers based on the agreement uh, uh, how to manipulate their um, attributes or their local preference based on the commit settings that they set. <coughs> uh, here is another example also from uh, uh, Verizon. So also here to, for different purposes, 70280 will be to set the local preference to 80, 70120, local preference 120 and so on. Uh, here are some more examples. So they are more or less the same. So here is another one for BT. Um, 5400, 1000 implies all peers and transits. Um, 5400, 1500 signifies all transits. Uh, 5400, 1501 signifies sp transiting through sprint and another 115.02, transiting through service and so on. So this is how they communicate to their, to their uh, uh, transit receivers uh, what those prefixes are. So the prefix that they advertise to those, prefix, to those uh, transit receivers. So here's another one for level three, so you can review it. <clears throat> but you can go to each of these websites and to other service providers and see uh, what type, uh, how they use communities to communicate uh, uh, routing attribute decisions between the service provider and their partners, peers, customers, and transit receivers. Okay, <clears throat> getting back to the, the main session. Um, <clears throat> Here first we'll discuss the role of IGPs and IBGPs, what, when to use each one of them and when not to use. 
the importance of aggregation, um, receiving prefixes from different entities, uh, using origin validation to make sure that um, the, the route received from a specific origin is really an authenticated origin. And we will see the reason why that's important, preparing the network and configuration tips. So the role of IG, uh, IGPs and IBGP. So first let's discuss BGP versus OSPF, ISIS. OSPF and ISIS are the main IGP protocols used in service providers. So the IGPs, ISIS and OSPF, they are used to carry infrastructure addresses, like interface addresses, uh, loopback IP addresses, and so on within the service provider network. They are not used to carry customer addresses. And they are not used to carry, obviously, other service provider uh, prefixes. <clears throat> so the design goal is to minimize the load on IGP so that IGP converges faster. Because BGP recurses into IGP, so it, it depends on IGP. So a, a fast converging IGP is also important for BGP convergence. So internally, you can use BGP using obviously IBGP and then uh, externally using eBGP. So IBGP for internal use is used to carry customer prefixes. Uh, also some internal prefixes, particularly towards the edge. For edge devices, instead of carrying them in IGP, you can carry them in uh, BGP, in IBGP. But the prefixes that you carry in IBGP does not necessarily go to your eBGP updates. And usually they don't. And we'll discuss that also. So eBGP is used to exchange prefixes with other ASs. And you also apply routing policies there. So again, to review the model, you have IGP and IBGP within a network, and then eBGP between networks. Very important to note here, it's very important not to distribute BGP into IGP, also not to redistribute IGP into BGP. It's, it's do not use also IGP to carry customer prefixes. It's very important to inject customer prefix into BGP because you want to reduce the size of your IGP so that IGP converges faster. So this, the, 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 uh, these are very important. So how do we inject routes into BGP? And we'll discuss that later on. But it's not by distributing IGP into BGP. You have to inject specific prefixes uh, using network statements and uh, static routes instead of just distributing routes. So <clears throat> again, use IBGP to carry customer prefixes, customer prefix of that ISP, essentially. Uh, you can point the static route to the customer interface, or you may even, depending on scenario, you may even uh, uh, create a, a floating static point, uh, static route uh, that will not go our way. Even if the customer interface goes down, you don't want that to propagate to the rest of the network. Obviously, you don't redistribute customer prefixes directly to your eBGP peers. You only use this for your internal uh, routing purpose, for your internal table. So if you want to inject routes, uh, customer routes as well as your own route into BGP, you can use network segments as well. But when you redistribute into your eBGP, you have to make sure that you are only you are advertising or aggregate prefixes. You don't want to advertise specific prefixes. For customers, typically you don't run eBGP, uh, uh, BGP with your customers. But if you have a big customer that's peering with you at multiple locations or that's connected with your uh, network at multiple locations, it's important to have some kind of routing protocol and BGP is a better, uh, is um, 
better than other protocols for that purpose. So in that case, it's, it's good to use BGP with the customer. Exchange routes with, uh, uh, using BGP with the customer. So there are two scenarios. It's possible that the prefixes are from your own prefixes. So you assign those prefixes to the customer. Even in that case, it's important to exchange routes with the, cu with, with the customer if you are peering at multiple locations or connect, if the customer is connected at multiple locations. Uh, the other scenario is if the customer is peering not just with you, but with other service providers, and if it has its own address space, it's important to exchange those routes as well. So, but in that case, those routes, those prefixes are assigned directly to that service, to that customer. You don't want to advertise a prefix assigned to that customer from another service provider to another service provider. You only advertise or receive advertisements, prefixes assigned to that, service, to that customer either from your address space or directly to the customer from a registry. Okay, <clears throat> so aggregation. So you notice the question here, quality or quantity? <clears throat> when you aggregate, you are reducing the size of the, your routing table. Um, and improving the quality of the internet in general. And we'll see the reason why. <clears throat> when you advertise specific routes, you are increasing the size of the internet table. You may achieve some level of um, traffic engineering, but there are other ways to achieve that. So it's not really uh, good or advisable to send specific routes that are not aggregated from customers to the rest of the network. So aggregation is very important. So aggregation means basically advertising blocks received directly from registry or uh, received um, uh, through the standard class-based um, allocation, which is rare, all right? So sub-prefixes of the registry assigned addresses can be advertised to some service providers for interaction engineering purpose, but it shouldn't be propagated to the rest of the internet. So it should be uh, uh, advertised to some service providers uh, by agreement, and then it's important that those service providers do not subsequently advertise to other service providers. Only the aggregate should be advertised. Again, this is important for the stability of the whole internet. But as you will see some of the numbers, a lot of people advertise more specific prefixes than the registry um, entries. So the registries are normally slash 22 and lower, but you will see a lot of slash 24s on the internet. Um, <clears throat> again, sub prefixes should not be advertised to the rest of the network, they may be advertised to some service providers for traffic engineering purpose. And usually, uh, we'll see some of, there are some uh, tools and websites that are tracking the prefixes, and some of the service providers who are not complying are normally regarded poorly by the community. And you'll see some of those, and you can see the, the reports for yourself. <clears throat> Registries publish their uh, uh, minimum allocation size, and it ranges from slash 22 to slash 22. Uh, in some cases, there are slash 24s because we are, we are running out of uh, address space, the IPv4 address space. Uh, here is uh, a bad example. Let's say S100 has a customer, has assigned IP address from its own address space to the customer, which is a slash 23. So it has a slash 19 assigned from re the registry, and it has assigned slash 23 to, its to one of the, its customers. 
So if it advertises that slash 23 to, as to the rest of the internet, that's really a bad example and creates a problem. So why? Suppose the customer link goes down. What happens? When the customer link goes down, that route will be withdrawn from the service provider. And the service provider will withdraw that from the rest of the internet. And that will propagate through, throughout the internet. And when the link comes back later on, the service provider advertises that route, sorry, the customer advertises that route to the service provider. And then the service provider advertises that route again to the rest of the internet. And then second time causes another um, churn to the internet. So when that adds up from multiple service providers, it creates a lot of churn to the internet. So that's the reason, that's, that's one of the reasons why um, it's important not to advertise the customer prefix that you assign to the customer to the rest of the internet. You can just assign the slash 19 uh, only to the rest of the internet, but in some cases maybe just uh, maybe slash 20 is for traffic engineering purpose, but it's not really important, necessary to advertise the customer as a prefix to the rest of the internet. Uh, here is a good example. The, again, the uh, AS100 has assigned slash 23, but it's only advertising slash 19. So when the route goes down, when the customer slash 19 route goes down or the interface goes down, the route is withdrawn from the AS100, the service provider, but nothing happens to, to, happens to the rest of the internet. The, 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 the impact is only to that network. So if you think about it, even for the customer, in the previous case, for the customer to receive traffic from the rest of the network, that prefix has to, pro to propagate throughout the network before it receives traffic for that prefix. But in this case, since nothing is going to the internet and traffic is coming to that prefix anyways, since traffic is coming to that prefix and getting dropped at the, uh, at the uh, upstream ISP, which is ISP 100, when the traffic is advertised, the customer will receive traffic quickly. So it's good for the customer, it's good for the rest of the internet. So good example is what everyone should do, but for different reasons, that doesn't happen. And normally it is for lack of understanding of how uh, the impact and the value, and uh, in some cases um, just uh, disregard for um, uh, you know, poor knowledge essentially. <clears throat> So another very important thing is it's very important to separate routes with an IBGP and routes that are sent across IBGP. Routes that re remain with an IBGP includes customer prefixes, some of the infrastructures even that are not in the core are in IBGP. But you don't advertise those to IBGP, you only advertise the aggregate address space. And you don't want to do traffic engineering based on a customer prefix. If you want to do traffic engineering, you should, you, you, the ISP should create other sub prefixes and then split them across multiple service providers or upstream providers instead of using directly the customer prefix. By doing that, it is making the network stable because those prefixes will remain active because they are being advertised from multiple points. So here is from a year ago. Um, so the BGP table says, we'll see some of the today's numbers later on. The, um, it's about 45,000, 450,000 plus uh, on the internet. But a year ago it was 420,000 uh, internet routing table. Uh, and, they, and if you do CIDR aggregation based on the CIDR address space, you can reduce it to, four, to 243. If T is aggregated using a maximum aggregation mechanism, it can even go down to 181,000. 
So you can see that it can, the current table can easily be aggregated to be more efficient, which is either 250 or 180,000, but it was 420,000 last year. So the same proportion pretty much remains the same this year. This year it's around 450,000. But what this shows you is a number of service providers are not really aggregating based on the side or, um, or the registry uh, uh, size. And as you can see, um, there are some other spaces that are producing a lot of prefixes. So if you look at this table, this is from 1999. In 1999, the 24 slash 8 and some of the 192 slash 8, particularly the 192 slash 8, was the one that was generating a lot of the uh, prefixes, which was uh, 6,000 per slash 8. But in 2010, that has changed significantly and 64 slash 8, um, 66 slash 8, and 74 slash 8 and so on. The ones that are highlighted are generating a lot more prefixes per slash 8. So these are, they are called the new swamps. So the 120 20 RIRs combined, if they generate 5,000 prefixes per slash 8, will increase the, routing, the internet routing table to over 635,000. If that number goes to 6,000 per slash 8, uh, you know, uh, as per the trend, the internet routing table may go to 762,000 and so on. So why is a new swamp? So some of the reasons are lack of knowledge. In some cases, just not being you know, laziness, essentially. Um, in some cases, they know it, but they think it is necessary, and they do it. So efforts to improve. Um, there was some initiative that was done early on, uh, started by Tony and then revised by uh, Philip Smith. And Philip Smith used to deliver this presentation, actually, uh, and now combined with Jobs Houston. Um, there's a CIDR report. You can go there and check the different reports, and we'll see some of them here. <clears throat> so, it computes the size of the routing table, assuming ISPs perform optimal aggregation, and compares it to what it is uh, without that optimal aggregation. So if we look at the, the next table here, now this is from uh, yesterday, or um, it's from yesterday. So you can see that, <coughs> so it's not fully visible, but you can see that the uh, the prefixes, current prefixes, total prefix on the internet are 457,000 plus. But if they were side or aggregated, they would have been reduced to 261,000. Okay. So in summary, there are 44,000 ASs in the routing system but only 18,000 of them announce one prefix. The rest announce multiple prefixes to the internet. And 3,000 is the largest number of prefix announced by a single S, and that's Bell's house. And you'll see that report on the next one. So here is a ranking of basically who is advertising more prefixes to the internet. And as you can see, it's Bell South, and it was Bell South last year also. Um, it's Bell South advertising 3,000, and the next one is May Services for uh, uh, 2,700 uh, and so on. You can see the rankings. 
So you can see this ranking um, for any day. <coughs> So this is per origin S. Uh, the previous one was what, uh, what was announced. Again, also per origin S, um, Bell South is the uh, largest. Um, and then who is advertising more specific prefixes than what is provided to them? And you can see it is still Bell South, but the others change a little bit. And here, um, the, here is some aggregation suggestion. So based on the analysis, the tool does analysis and then suggests uh, what should be uh, added and what should be removed. So the red ones are what is suggested to be removed and the green ones, the, the aggregate prefix. So the tool does really a good job of analyzing it and suggesting uh, aggregation alternatives. So importance of size of routing table. So it's very important to understand that today memory is not an issue. So you can really have millions of routes. Most of the routers that are um, available today, they can do millions of routes. So that's not the main issue. Even CPU has also increased significantly. There is a lot of CPU. But at the same time, there is a significant um, expectation that BGP should converge faster, faster than it used to. So if you want to converge BGP faster with large number of routes, even if you have large memory, so the memory doesn't really influence the convergence, it is a CPU, so, so the size is not really because of the memory issue, it's mostly because of the convergence issue. The expectation is BGP needs to converge faster because there are lots of applications that depend heavily on the convergence of the network in general. So it's important to, that BGP converges faster and to do that, you have two things to play with. One, you can reduce the size of the BGP table and second one is you can increase CPU. And obviously CPU has been increasing, but at the same time the expectation of convergence has been also getting higher, but the size of the BGP table has been increasing. So it's important still to, to make sure that people uh, you know, follow the uh, guidelines and reduce the BGP table size so that the internet converges faster. And here is the, another report, BGP instability report. Um, this shows you for the past seven days, the most active ASs. So you can see in this case, so this is the past seven days, so it doesn't mean that this is always the case. Maybe there is some specific event that caused this problem, but you can see that um, uh, ASN 36998, which is SDN mobile, Mobitel, has been very active for the past seven days. And um, with 9.69 percentage of the impact, essentially, um, and followed by others. <coughs> but um, it's a really nice report that you can see all this. Um, again, 50 most active uh, past seven days. This is another past seven days. Here is another uh, also report. The URL is also shown there. Here, what this shows is the green line shows you the BGP table over time. And you can see that today it is over 450,000. The next line, which is uh, the purple line shows you what it would be if it is aggregated based on the AS pass. If you aggregate prefixes based on identical AS pass, <coughs> you can reduce it by almost, uh, to almost uh, 250,000. 
if you use um, if you use as origin instead of as pass for aggregation, you can even further reduce it below 200,000. So there's a lot of room to play with to reduce the size of the PHP table on the internet if people comply with some of the suggestions. So in summary, um, the aggregation could be much better. It's possible to get a 5% saving if the recommendations are implemented. A lot of people are implementing them, but some are not. So, and it's just the, the summary report uh, pushes people to, to be more conforming than um, violating some of those uh, rules. Any questions on aggregation? So receiving prefixes. So a service provider may receive prefixes from a customer, from a peer, or from a transit provider, or upstream transit provider. So we'll see each one of them. From a customer, ISP should not accept prefixes which have been assigned to the customer by another ISP. If the customer has prefixes that are assigned by another ISP, this ISP should not advertise those prefixes to the rest of the internet. Should not even receive them from the customer. But if the ISP has assigned those prefixes to the customer, then the customer can advertise them, and it's useful particularly if the customer is connected to the service provider at multiple points. And it gives you uh, redundancy as well as load balancing. <clears throat> also, if the customer has received uh, an assigned IP address or IP address block from a registry, then the customer can advertise it to multiple service providers because it is explicitly assigned to that ISP, to that customer, and also has its own uh, AS number. You can check who owns a specific prefix using the who is tool, basically. Here is one example. In this particular example, um, it's checking uh, the prefix 202, 12290 uh, on the uh, ethnic database the registry and it shows that it's assigned and it's portable which means it can be used. And here um, in this case you can see that it is allocated and specified so this is basically assigned by the, from, from the service provider address space. So basically you can use who is to check whether a specific prefix has been assigned to a customer. If the customer says I have an IP address uh, that I received from a registry, it's important to check it. What about from a peer? From a peer, it depends on the agreement. Usually there is a bilateral agreement between peers or there may be some, um, in, in the public peering scenario, um, there will be some, you have to verify that the, the, the prefix is assigned to that service provider or to its customers before you can um, uh, exchange those prefixes typically. So, <clears throat> So when you, when you get into an agreement, you can exchange emails and document them. You can also check the registry to see if those addresses have been assigned to that um, ISP or to its customers. You can also use, this is a new uh, mechanism, use origin ace validation, which we'll discuss later on. From upstream service providers, um, usually you have a you know, few alternatives. If you are peering with multiple service, uh, getting transits from multiple service providers, you can receive the full table from each one of them. 
usually that's costly. If you are um, receiving, um, if you are just using one transit provider, you may just point a default route to that service provider or receive a default route from that service provider. In some cases, you may receive partial routes. If you are peering with a service provider at multiple locations, and if it's just one service provider, you can use partial, which means you can use the, uh, the, the routes from the, the internal network of the service provider, but the rest of the internet, you will use default. So default plus partial. So three scenarios, you, you will either point a default uh, or receive default plus partial or receive full, in, full table, particularly if you are peering with multiple transit providers. Um, <clears throat> again, when you receive routes from transit providers, it's important to make sure that you do a filtering. You make sure that you are not receiving private IP addresses, make sure you are not receiving bogons that are maintained by uh, Team Simers. Uh, uh, make sure that for IPv6, also make sure that uh, those prefixes are, uh, are not in that list shown there. Um, and Team Simers regularly publishes bogon prefixes, so it's important to implement bogon filters to filter those bogon prefixes. You can also receive bogon advertisements from Team Simers to, to make it dynamic instead of uh, waiting for, um, instead of checking the bogon table frequently. Okay. Um, so in summary, it's important to pay attention what types of prefixes you are receiving from your customers, your peers, as well as from transit providers. It's, it's important for the integrity of your own network as well as for the integrity of the internet. Any questions? So we'll discuss some of the issues involved with receiving prefixes and advertising prefixes. We'll, we'll see some specific cases where it caused a significant outage to the internet and how we can use uh, origin validation to uh, fix that problem. <clears throat> Um, I'll go specifically to this example. So this is well-documented example and we'll see the specific case. Take the following scenario. Let's say uh, there is a client there and um, two S, S20 and S40 advertise the same prefix. Let's say that S belongs to S20 legitimately belongs to S20, sorry, S40. But both S20 and S40 advertise the same prefix. By default, because S20 is a shorter pass, S20 will be picked. So unless there is a mechanism to verify that S20 owns that prefix and make sure that S10 blocks th that prefix received from S20, then traffic coming from the client to that prefix will go through AS20 and may be blocked or dropped somewhere. So this is one case. Here's another case. Even for the same, even if the, the, the AS pass is shorter, if somebody advertises a more specific route of that prefix, then traffic will go to the more specific route, even if that pass is longer pass. And traffic will be black holed because of that. There was one such case a few years back, I think about three years ago. <clears throat> uh, what happened was uh, Pakistan Telecom advertised Yahoo's, uh, sorry, uh, YouTube's prefix, a more specific version of YouTube's prefix to the internet. So they didn't do it intentionally. I think there was some request from the government that they block YouTube um, because of some cultural reasons. And to do that, they went this way, obviously um, lack of technical knowledge on, their, on, on the people who did that. 
And by doing that, what happened was any prefix that was going to YouTube ended up going to uh, uh, Pakistan Telecom. So obviously it's not good for Pakistan because it will overwhelm their network and it, it was not good for YouTube because uh, nobody was able to access YouTube service for, uh, I think, for part of a day or for a full day. And that was because Pakistan Telecom advertised a more specific version of a YouTube prefix. In this case, they advertised a slash 24, of the, but YouTube was advertising slash 22 because YouTube was being good from the, for the internet and advertising only um, uh, the prefix, the slash 22 prefix to make internet stable, but Pakistan Telecom was advertising more specific, so attracting the whole table, the whole traffic to them. So question is, how do you prevent that? So as a result of that and other incidents, they started working the, the uh, security um, internet domain routing working group with an ITF started working on the um, origin ACE validation. And you'll see, uh, you see those and then if you go to the, uh, to the working group, you'll see a lot of uh, drafts and RFCs associated with origin validation in RPKI. RPKI refers to <coughs> the resource public key infrastructure that's used to do origin validation. And in summary, here is what it looks like. So there is, there is um, a remote distributed RPKI repository that stores the legitimate owner of each prefix. So the, the origin AS of each prefix and through RPKI cache, a service provider can receive the RPKI cache information from the cache servers. It is not a BGP protocol, it's a different protocol. But um, now I, I believe uh, at least a couple of vendors have already implemented it, including Cisco and Juniper. But uh, I'm sure others have already uh, started implementing it, implementing it. So what you do is you receive this from the registries. And then when you receive a route from uh, a service provider or a peer, you can check it against the database automatically. And then it will uh, classify the uh, validity, validity status. So here is uh, an example. Let's say, <clears throat> let's say the registry database has uh, what we call ROA. Um, ROA is on the right side. And let's say you receive from your peer or from your eBGP peer those prefix on the left side. So the first one is in the registry and it matches. That is, the, S, the origin AS number matches the origin AS number in the registry, in the cache. So it's considered to be valid. Okay? In the second case, there is no matching, the, uh, in the second case, there is no matching prefix. Um, 1001 slash 24, oh, there is a matching there's a matching prefix, which is 10, 0, slash 16 through 24. Um, there's a matching prefix, but, but the origin S is different. The origin S in this case is 200, and in some cases 300, but the origin S received is 400. So in this case, it is invalid. So that S is not allowed to originate that prefix. So it's not a legitimate originator. The third case is there is no match. So it's not in the registry. So in this case, it's considered as unknown. So, so what happens is as this table is being built, some of the, the uh, routes may not be in the registry for some of the service providers. In that case, it will be in an unknown state. From a preference perspective, obviously you would prefer valid and then unknown, then invalid is the last one. And normally, after that you can apply policy. 
So this is a classification, and then BGP is policy oriented, then you can apply policy. You can say, if it is invalid, block it, drop it, or prefer it less. If it is unknown, prefer it less. Something like that. But you can, you can apply policies to influence the decision. The, the, but the job of the, the RPKI system or the origin um, uh, validation system, origin is validation system, is to validate the origin. So once the, the validation has happened, the border router can notify other routers through a new extended community about the state of the origin validation, either invalid, unknown, or valid. And then other routers can decide what to do with that, based on policy, obviously. Question? on original validation. Okay, so the next one is just how to implement on roll, roll out BGP in, in your network. So you will need ASA number, obviously. If you want to deploy BGP, you need automatic system number. Um, if you are multi oming to multiple ISPs, you will need a public automatic system number. If you are just peering with one ISP, you can use a private ASA number. Obviously, you have to agree, right? If you need, if you are going to peer with multiple service providers, then you need to get your own assigned IP address from the registry if you can't get it, right? So it's, it's running short, right? Or you can get, if you are just peering with one ISP at multiple locations, then you can get it from that ISP. <clears throat> so the assumption is there is no BGP running and there is no IGP running. So it's just a new network starting essentially. So first you have to decide what type of IGP protocol to run. OSP for ISIS, both of them are link state. Um, depending on, it may end up being, the decision may be, you know, which protocol do I feel comfortable with or which protocol do I know most or my, my team knows the, the most and you'll go with that one, typically. Um, some people prefer ISI, some people prefer OSPF, so that's a different set of questions, but typically you will pick one of them. Then obviously you have to have loopback IP addresses configured. Obviously the loopback IP address will be slash 32, and you ha they have to be injected into IGP. Um, and then you'll, you'll start um, it's used for BGP peering as well as for route origination. Uh, that's the loopback IP address. It's also used for uh, router ID for BGP. If you have a network that has a static routes, you can deploy IGP without impacting your network because in most cases, static route has higher preference over IGP so by, right, by employing, uh, by adding IGP, you are not really changing the routing within your network. But once you deploy IGP and make sure that the IGP is working properly, you can start removing the static routes and then make that the, your, your whole network is running IGP. So it's very important that you, your link state database is lean. So you don't want to inject BGP into your IGP or, or inject your customer networks into IGP. That will make your IGP large and reduce your convergence time for IGP. And convergence time of IGP is very, very important. Okay. <clears throat> 
So if you have routes that do not go into IGP, for example, if you have customers that are being aggregated through DS, uh, DSL, or you have customers that uh, you have assigned IP address from your address space, then you can inject those prefixes into I, IBGP. You don't need to put them in, uh, in IGP. And also the interface address from your router to your, uh, to your customer, uh, you don't need to inject it into IGP. You can put them in, in uh, BGP. Okay. The second stage is once you have your IGP, second stage is to, uh, to build your IBGP. Obviously, if you have a small network, you can do a full mesh IBGP. If you anticipate large network, or if you have a large network, then you have to do either confederation or route reflector. Obviously, route reflector is better if you are starting fresh. So you will have to pick a couple of routers as route reflectors, or if it is very large network, then you may split into multiple zones, and each one of them will have um, couple of route reflectors for redundancy purpose. So, and IBGP must run on all routers that are potentially used for transit traffic. And transit means transit from a customer to the rest of the internet, or transit from one customer to another, or transit from uh, one service provider to another service provider. So the next phase is um, build the transit paths. So here in this particular example, you can see that A, A and B are obviously transits, but in case the link between A and B goes down, D is also a transit. But T, E, F are not really transit in this case. So which means C, E, F do not really need to get the full internet routing table or the full table. But A, B, D have to have the full internet table if this network is going to become a transit. So typically, if, if you have a transit, uh, if you are becoming a transit, if you are going to become a transit, um, and in most cases, actually, you will have multiple layers. Um, here is an example, a core distribution and aggregation. And typically, the core has to have the full, the full internet table. The aggregation doesn't need to, ha to participate in the full inter uh, IBGP table, but the distribution, depending on the scenario, may or may not participate in full um, uh, internet table exchange. Again, the key is if in, a, in any circumstance any router may become a transit, then that router needs to have the full internet table. So for aggregation layer, IBGP is optional because you can run other protocol or just IGP, and then at the distribution layer, you can inject those routes into IBGP. Or you can run, you can extend your IBGP to aggregation layer and then inject uh, routes there. But it doesn't need to carry the full internet table. It can participate in IBGP and carry only the internal network table, but it doesn't need to carry the full uh, internet table. And Actually, most aggregation, uh, a lot of the aggregation devices may not even run BGP, may not even support BGP uh, routing protocol. The distribution layer usually runs IBGP. Uh, it may carry the full table, or it may, it may carry just partial, depending on, again, whether there is a possibility that it may become a transit or not. If it is going to become a transit, then it has to carry a full internet table, if, if there is no reason, if, if we know that there is no way that, that the uh, distribution layer will be a transit, 
then there is no need to carry the full table. Partial will be sufficient. Okay. <clears throat> Again, um, it doesn't have to run IBGP. In most cases, it will run IBGP. It doesn't have to carry the full internet table. In most cases, it doesn't. But the core has to participate in full uh, BGP, should run IBGP, should carry the full internet table. The core includes the AS border routers as well. So now um, you have to decide on policy. So do, we, do I want to have full internet table everywhere or partial somewhere and full somewhere or no IBGP somewhere and full uh, IBGP uh, in some places? So depending on your circumstance, you'll decide that. And obviously you have to implement communities for scaling purpose. Uh, again, if you think that your network is going to grow or it is large already, then you have to implement uh, route reflectors. Uh, configuration templates are always important. Um, and <coughs> configuration templates makes it easier to scale your configuration and also make the, your, your system stable. <coughs> so what you do is to implement IBGP you will implement IBGP mesh on select routers. Let's say if you have few route reflectors, you will have IBGP mesh between the route reflectors, and then there will be clients to those route reflectors. Uh, another important thing is you have to make sure that IBGP distance is greater than IGP distance. Uh, distance is a preference in terms of routing protocol, which protocol to be used when deciding uh, that where, uh, if a prefix is received from two different protocols or multiple protocols, then the distance of the protocol determines which one is the best. The lower distance is preferred. <clears throat> Typica typically, for example, on a Cisco system, IBGP uses a distance of 200, and IGP is used depending on the IGP. Um, I think for OSP and ISI, ISIS, it's about 110, 115. But it is lower than uh, IBGP. Step two, you will install customer prefixes into BGP and make sure that the network is still working. And you can inject them using by pointing a static null to a static route to the customer or a static null to uh, at the border router, a floating static null. <coughs> so that's the stable. Um, and then, since you already have static routes, initially you have to gradually remove them and make sure that IGP takes care of that. <clears throat> and finally, you will configure um, EBGP peer with your um, transit providers, uh, peers, or customers. So now, <clears throat> Installing customer prefixes. Again, here is a, a summary. We have already discussed some of this. If you have a customer assigned address space, you can use a network statement to inject those prefixes. And you can use unique community to make sure that those prefixes are not advertised outside your network. If, if those prefixes are advertised from your own address space, you don't want to advertise the specific routes to other uh, uh, service providers. <clears throat> the customer facing point to point links, typically you can inject them into BGP, IBGP, uh, that's, and, and then use Next Hub Self instead of using, redistributing them into IGP. And if you have uh, pools and local LANs, you can use, again, no network statements to assign a uh, prefix for those um, networks. 
Again, we will carefully remove the static routes one route at a time. And this is assuming migration from a static route. So if you don't have anything, if you are starting from a scratch, then you don't have static route. You start from IBGP. So in this particular case, we assume that initially there was static routes, which is usually very unlikely. But the key here is most of these steps that we have discussed are not flag raised, which means it doesn't really cause um, disruption. So you can do them step by step, step by step at different times, at different maintenance windows. Any questions? Okay. <clears throat> So here we'll discuss some configuration tips and, and summarize some of, the, some of the discussions we discussed with respect to configuration. So uh, it's very important that you use loopback IP addresses for IBGP peering. Also use the loopback IP address as a next hub using next hub self instead of um, and instead of using the interface IP address, directly connected interface IP address as an X hub, which is a default behavior. The DAM is the networks, that's the networks that connect your network to your peer, either customer or uh, another service provider. Um, you can inject them using, using IBGP, but if you do that, then you have to use next hub self. So again, summarizing the next hub self. By default, BGP speakers announce external networks to IBGP peers without changing the next hub, which is a directly connected uh, interface or the peering IP address. But that's not recommended. It's better to override that with next hub self. And this is used by most service providers. Another important um, consideration, um, some implementations of BGP do not support ASPAS language beyond a certain number. So it's important that you do not exceed the ASPAS lengths beyond a certain number. Um, normally more than 20 is really too much. Uh, there are tools, uh, you, you can use BGP Play to see you know, what's the maximum lengths on the internet, unique lengths. Uh, if you do prepend, don't prepend too much because, because those routers may drop your advertisements. Those routers do not, do not support ASPAS lengths beyond, below, be, beyond certain number may drop your uh, routes. So it's important when you do prepend make sure that you are not prepending too much. So as you can see from uh, the last year report, the average ASPAS length was 3.8. The maximum ASPAS length is, is 13. But with a prepend, there were some ASPAS lengths that as long as 34. And you can see that the, the, uh, that's really bad behavior because the maximum length was 13. So if you exceed 13, that, that's not enough. So the prepend should have just resulted in 14 instead of 34. But because it was not done carefully, it went up to 34. So here is an example of you know, ridiculously long S pass lengths. And <coughs> um, in this case, actually, it is even unique. It's not even uh, any prepend. The next one is a prepend. Next one is it has just two, three AS paths unique. The, in, the unique AS path language is actually three. The rest is prepended. The 12 or 26 is prepended so many times. So you can limit the maximum ASPAS lengths. 
Uh, another important aspect, um, important implementation is generalized TTL security mechanism, GTSM. Um, formerly it used to be BGP TTL hack, BGP TTL security hack, BTSH. With this, um, when you establish a BGP session, you can say, I will only accept BGP packets, which are TCP essentially, port 179, only if the TTL is 254 or 255. For that to happen, your peer has to set the TTL to 255. So the advantage of that is if, some, if somebody wants to stop to establish a false TCP session, an authorized TCP session from beyond that router, it will not be able to do that because by the time the packet arrives to your router, the TTL has gone below the TTL threshold that you set using the GT GTSM features. Most of the modern routers have implemented this in hardware, so it's actually filtered in hardware. Um, so that helps you it doesn't actually um, penalize your, your CPU. It's blocked in hardware. If the TTL exceeds 254, it's automatically dropped if you implement this feature. So it's, it's an important security feature. So you can see that a legitimate traffic, it says TTL of 255, so it works fine. But somebody from outside trying to uh, hijack your TCP session, by the time the packet arrives to, your, to the router, it's already less than the threshold and it will be dropped. Okay. Templates. Um, most of the configurations, for, let's say you have uh, uh, several IBGP peers from a router, a router reflector, most of those, conf those configurations are the same. So you can combine the similar configurations into a template and then apply it to individual uh, uh, peers. So that's a basically templating. Same thing with a policy, prefix list, and so on. So it's, it's a good practice to use templates for everything because even if, even if you have just one peer now, you may have multiple peers in the future, so it's better to start from a template, even if you don't need it today. You may need it down the road. And there are some templates, um, suggested templates, again from Tim, uh, I think this pronounced Kimru, uh, from Tim Kimru. And you can look at for different templates for, for different OSs, uh, router operating systems. And you can apply those, you can use some of those templates. You can use them as a starting point to build your own template. Uh, <clears throat> for example, an IBGP template may contain things like next hub self for all IBGP peers. Uh, you can say, do my IBGP session from the loopback IP address. Uh, you can also say, send communities. Um, in some cases, in, you may have to explicitly say BGP version 4, even though almost there is no any other version nowadays. In some cases, it's not even applicable. Like, for example, in Cisco XR, version four is the only version supported in XR, so there is no configuration for version four. But if you have that option, set it explicitly. Um, you can use MD5 password, MD5 uh, password for your session to make it secure, for in addition to the TTL hack mechanism or the GTSM mechanism. You can apply things like remove private ASs. It's very important to do that when you receive updates from your, or, or when you send updates to your um, eBGP peers, it's important to remove them. Also, when you receive, it's important to remove them. So it's good to have multiple layers of security, not just one. So 
it's good to have a backup. If you use prefix-based filter, you can use also community-based filter, just a backup to make sure that um, if there's a mistake in one, it will not impact, it will not have uh, effects. Uh, another one is you can limit the number of routes received from a peer or the total number of routes received by the router. And you can set it such that you receive warning or you can set it such that you reset the session. Um, you can again limit the maximum AS pass lanes received. Uh, you can, it's important to log changes of neighbor state. So if you configure that then whenever the, the neighbor goes up and down, this, uh, it will be, uh, a syslog will be generated and it will be in syslog and it helps you in troubleshooting any potential problem. Um, again, in summary, use configuration templates. Um, standardize the configurations across all your routers. You can start from the configuration template from uh, Timkinru. Um, use standard, uh, use the TTL security mechanisms. Um, and the templates usually help you reduce the overall load in terms of configuration. So it, it helps you scale. Okay, with that, the session is concluded. So we have, we have plenty of time. So it would be good if you have questions. For the regional network for the state of Louisiana, higher ed, I'm wondering what you recommend for logging uh, BGP prefixes and changes. You mean changes in BGP? Like a historical, we, we demoed a product by uh, Packet Design called Route Explorer. It's an excellent product, but it's just way too expensive. And mm. we've had trouble uh, finding a solution that may work that's a little more affordable for higher ed. Yeah, I'm not, uh, fortunately, I'm not aware of some of those tools. Most of the routers do not support that type of feature, but uh, obviously you can have a tool that will be, let's say, a client of a route reflector and receive those updates. But I'm not aware of the tools. Can I ask another question? Sure. Uh, RPKI, um, I'm wondering, um, we've got a scenario where we do appearing with LSU, uh, their AS 2055. They're advertising us a bunch of prefixes they own um, in uh, V4 and V6. Okay. And in a, a situation for their dorms, uh, we do a private uh, a BGP AS with them okay. uh, where we've allocated them our uh, V4 space, so it works fine, but they're advertising us their own V6 space. And I'm just wondering with RPKI, if it's doing that sanity check to see who owns that prefix, uh, is that going to break their V6, um, you know, when we advertise it out? Yeah, I, I, either you have to disable RPK checking with them, uh, otherwise they have to use their assigned AS number for RPK to work. All right, Randy Bush, Dragon Labs. Um, no, they don't. You, um, whoever he is, or is he hiding? Ah, there you are. You have a separate trust anchor and have under that trust anchor a certificate for the AS and for, for the prefix that you're talking about and undoubtedly you have many of these cases and ROAs for them and then your routers will properly validate that. Okay? Um, there are even further more Baroque cases where what you want is to edit the structure. The whole game of the RPKI is the power is with the relying party, 
you who are running the routers, the operator. And so there's even further something, a draft that's out there, and there's one and a half implementations called local trust anchor, where you can actually remove things from the public tree and substitute your own. Um, people doing um, complex private arrangements would use this. Um, there are um, um, governments who like to um, edit the internet even more than ours does, to whom this appeals, etc. Thanks. Thanks, Rani. Questions? All right, thanks. I'll be here if you have more questions.